Good afternoon. To our guest of honor, Her Excellency, the First Lady of Namibia, Madam Monica Gengos, the President and Council Members of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, members of the judiciary here present, senior counsel, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second public lecture of the Africa Hub of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. My name is Linda Kasonde, and I am the Vice President for Africa for the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, and I am your host this afternoon. The Commonwealth Lawyers Association, or CLA as it is otherwise known, is an association of lawyers from across the Commonwealth that seeks to promote and to protect human rights and the rule of law. I invite you all to become members of the CLA and to participate in our various activities, such as our public lectures. We will be holding our next biennial conference in the Bahamas in September this year, and we invite you all to attend. Please do check our website for further details. This public lecture series is an initiative of the Africa Hub of the CLA. The objective of the public lecture series is to invite eminent lawyers and judges to share their knowledge and experiences with a wide audience in the African Commonwealth and beyond. We are honored to have as our second speaker, the First Lady of Namibia, Madam Monica Gengos. Madam Gengos has achieved rock star status on the continent with her bold and thought provoking statements on youth, women and leadership. Most recently, her statement on the occasion of International Women's Day on the theme, Choose to Challenge, met with applause from many women who could identify with the pressure women face to shrink to society's expectations. She will expound on those views in her lecture this afternoon, entitled Beyond Barriers, Opportunities for Women in Positions of Influence. Here to introduce her formally is the president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, Mr. Brian Spears. Thank you. Well, thank you, Linda, uh, and uh, greetings, First Lady. This is uh, a real delight, treat, and honor for the Commonwealth Lawyers Association uh, to have you deliver your lecture this afternoon, and we very much look forward to what you have to say. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the audience that is listening, and I uh, very much have enjoyed uh, researching some of uh, your, your speeches, your profile, and uh, I look forward to giving this introduction. The uh, connection between me personally and Namibia, I shared in our little advanced chat uh, where I found myself on a high-speed minivan from uh, Windhoek to Swakopmund, and um, uh, while at once engaged with the changing landscape, uh, I was also um, concerned about the, the safety of that mode of transport, but I uh, have lived to tell the tale and would very much like one day to get back to your beautiful country. Can I uh, thank Linda for her work as chair of the Africa Hub and vice president of the CLA for bringing together this inspired lecture series of which this is uh, the second. Uh, Your Excellency, you are um, a lawyer educated uh, from the University of Namibia. Uh, and in March of 2015, you became uh, the first lady. I have noted often in your profile uh, that there is reference to your extensive uh, business career. A board member within many of the largest companies in Namibia. Uh, you have worked in the Namibia Stock Exchange and among many other business appointments have served as chair of the Bank of eBank Namibia, 
and such have been your stellar accomplishments in the world of banking and finance that you have served on the Economic Advisory Council and the National Council of the Namibia Chamber of Commerce. You have been well recognized with undoubtedly well-deserved honors, such as the most distinguished order of Namibia. And indeed, as befitting the rock star image, you have been inducted into the Namibia Hall of uh, Business fame and have received awards uh, from such as the Namibia Business Personality of the Year. Leaving aside your business interests to become First Lady, you have used your business experience to support such programs as the One Nation Fund and Talented Individual Program, which assists children from low-income families to have access to high quality education. A prominent woman in Namibia and in Africa, uh, you are a prominent advocate for gender equality and have been appointed a special advocate for young women and adolescent girls in the UN AIDS program. Always socially aware, the First Lady is the patron of the Shack Dwellers Federation of Namibia and chair of the board of Urban Poor Fund International. In 2020, First Lady, you were ranked as one of the 100 most influential African women. A lawyer, an entrepreneur, a board member and First Lady with an interest in social justice and support for women, access to education, and gender equality, it is undoubtedly a pleasure to introduce you, and it will be undoubtedly a pleasure to hear the second Africa Hub lecture from Your Excellency, the First Lady of Namibia, uh, Mrs. Monica Gengos. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Spears. I'm, I'm very concerned about your Namibian colleagues who put you on a minibus to swap with women. I'm not sure if your mediation training went well, if that's what they did, but we, we look forward to seeing you back here. <laughs> um, and thank you for the introduction. And, and I'd like to, um, to stand on the protocols that were established by, by Linda and really thank you for giving me an opportunity. Um, and uh, what I want to talk about really is an extension of that uh, International Women's Day um, video. Uh, but I want to take a little bit further and um, as Commonwealth, as a Commonwealth Lawyers Association, I don't, um, I don't seek to waste your time talking to you about the history of um, colonialism on the African continent or its uh, generational consequences. What I do want to talk about is how African women had to navigate the triple cocktail of tribalism, racism and sexism and um, oppression for us comes in many forms, but patriarchy has proven to be one of the most enduring forms. The most painful experience for me, for instance, is uh, debating an African man who understands the indignity of racism or tribalism, but uses the same fallacious arguments used by racists or tribalists to justify and minimize the lived experiences of women. You simply don't work hard enough. You complain too much. You have a victim mentality. In essence, you can't be trusted with responsibility. In the same way, I really dislike talking to unenlightened people about racism and my experiences of it. I also really dislike talking to unenlightened men about misogyny. Um, there's just too much gaslighting in those kind of conversations and, and way too little understanding. And the solutions when you talk to unenlightened people about issues that are your lived experience, it's never about the structural change that's required in the system. The solutions are always designed towards changing you. You're imagining it. Stop being so sensitive. Well, just work harder. You complain too much. And I often think about my father, um, who's now 87 years old, and our country, Namibia, 
votes every five years. And he never misses the opportunity to go and vote. And his obsession with voting is because he was not allowed to vote until he was the age of 56, which is when Namibia uh, attained her independence. His right to vote was not given to him. It was fought for collectively. People had to die to assert that they live, that they exist. Imagine giving up your life as many freedom fighters did because living under oppression was really not living at all. And my father who cherishes the right to vote does so because he experienced its denial. He lived through a time when articulating the wish for self-determination was both politically unacceptable and life-threatening. And contrast my father to my brother and I, when we reached voting age, he literally had to throw us out of bed to go and vote because to us, it wasn't a privilege. It was our legal entitlement that we could either exercise or not. We didn't live through a time when it was unacceptable or illegal. And this is how the Overton window shifts. What was once unthinkable in my father's generation was a norm for our generation. The Overton window is a political science dictum that explains how concepts which are regarded as outrageous and politically and socially unacceptable gradually become normalized, accepted, and legalized. And I look at how women's rights and economic participation have evolved in just 50 years. Ideas like a woman working are no longer revolutionary or prohibited as used to be the case. It's now normal. But the, so the Overton window has undeniably shifted in favor of women's rights, but it has not expanded enough to accommodate our full spectrum of needs and requirements. Do we really accept gender equality when we speak about women in the workplace, but we're still talking about sexual harassment in the workplace? We're still talking about pay inequities um, and glass ceilings, which inhibit our upward mobility. Many women leave the workplace as they can't always balance the unrealistic and inflexible expectations which do not take our unique circumstances into consideration. The explanation that the Overton window postulates is that politicians only pass policies that are socially and politically acceptable in that moment in time. If politicians feel that a policy will be so unpopular that it will come at a political cost to the authority, they will either not pass it or they will, after the public indicates clear hostility to it, they'll revoke it, which begs the question, why are we still even talking about gender equality in 2021? Why has the Overton window of political and social acceptance not shifted fast enough so that we can see real equality happening within our lifetime? According to the World Economic Forum's 2021 Global Gender Gap Report, it'll take an average of 135.6 years for women and men to reach parity on a range of factors. This is why I say that patriarchy and sexism has proven itself to be one of the most enduring forms of oppression. I know for sure that my journey and that of many African women at all levels has not been easy. Often when women from different countries, ethnicities, races, religions come together, our stories start out so differently, but they all meet at the intersection of patriarchy. It's not just an African problem, it's a, it's a global problem. Even apartheid laws, and, and many of you are aware that Namibia was subjected to apartheid laws. And apartheid laws were as racist as they were sexist. Imagine being a woman who, a white woman who approves of apartheid, yet you are not spared the sexism of apartheid. And I'm often surprised by those who hold strong views against racism, yet they harbor very strong views supporting tribalistic, homophobic, or sexist views. Because what's clear for me is that oppression comes in many forms and it dehumanizes whoever interacts with it. But I digress. I was talking about how women from different backgrounds often find similarities when we discussed, when we discuss our lived experiences. And in these private moments, we open up to one another of how misogyny has manifested itself in our lives. However, when we speak on platforms like these, we sanitize and package our challenges in, in polite languages and to avoid backlash, we often self-censor many of the experiences we share with one another in private. 
we, we tend to focus on quantifiable issues like um, the need to change labor laws and practices, improving education and, and, and outcomes. We, 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 look at, um, we look at a variety of things which aren't really what we really discussing when we are together. And, and often I feel we do need to be more open and sanitize less about our real challenges. We, we like to talk about uh, things that we can't argue about, like access to finance, women's legal and social status. I, I remember when Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iweala uh, was appointed as the World Trade Organization chief. And instead of saying that she was the first woman to head the World Trade Organization or, or highlighting her formidable quali qualifications, a Swiss daily newspaper headline read, this grandmother will become the new boss of the World Trade Organization. And in case we weren't offended enough, they continued. There are still doubts about the qualifications of the mother of four and grandmother. After their sexism was called out, they amended the headline to read, this 66 year old Nigerian becomes the new head of the WTO. Nothing about her qualifications or her experience. It was about being Nigerian. It was about being a grandmother. It was about being a mother and questioning her qualifications. I mentioned this because the outcry from men and women alike across racial boundaries was swift. The Swiss Daily was yet again forced to apologize and give Dr. Okonjo her due. And I was similarly pleased when I saw the new Tanzanian president say in one of her speeches that she is the president of Tanzania, not mama. I mentioned these two issues because women are no longer keeping silent. We have started to talk about things that society had told us aren't important to be talked about. As in Dr. Iweala's case, other women and men are also starting to speak out on behalf of others. History teaches us that the only way to defeat oppressive systems is through collective action. I don't have enough time to go through all the barriers women in leadership face, but I do want to speak about a few issues I feel we don't speak about often enough. I want to speak or start with how costly it is being an African career woman. I can certainly detail the financial cost, but I'm talking about a different type of cost. I'm talking about the cost to our relationships and to our understanding of who we are. Because don't forget, racism and misogyny often rewards those who comply with its unwritten rules. By being a career woman and not staying at home, you do not comply to social norms. Therefore, you do not get to escape what society believes to be your responsibilities at home. Many, many women experience the double jeopardy of being paid less than their male counterparts in the workplace and expected to do unpaid labor at home. This is true whether your husband is unemployed or whether he works as hard as you do. If I spend three hours doing unpaid labor at home every night, cooking, cleaning, making sure that homework is done, those are three hours that my male counterparts are using to network at evening events, to put in some extra hours of work or study for additional qualification. What holds me behind isn't necessarily just law, it's societal norms. When I was young and trying to establish myself, I needed reliable childcare. I needed, to, I needed help with cooking and cleaning and needing to collect children from school and taking them to sports. I didn't have enough money in the beginning of my career to afford decent wages for a childminder, nor could I afford to hire someone who could take my kids to school. We'll need to one day have an uncomfortable conversation about how we as women sometimes treat women who work in our houses, especially when we use our relatives from the village as a, as a source of cheap labor, but that's a conversation for another day. What I want to talk about is when I was advancing in my career, I could afford to throw money at my household challenges. I could afford to pay better wages for more reliable care. I could hire people to run errands for me, including picking up my children when uh, I'm busy, which was often. You may ask, what about the husband? Well, we already discussed this. 
Once a woman diverges from societal norms, it remains your responsibility to make sure things work both at home and at work. That's if you even have a husband. Many, many African women leaders in the public and the private sector are either single, childless, divorced, or have suboptimal marriages. Why can't we be leaders and have happy, fulfilling relationships that do not require our constant compromising of ourselves? I know of too many women, especially in my generation and the generation that follows mine, who have been so busy with their careers or have decided not to compromise on finding the right spouse that they've ended up um, over the age of 40, single, childless, by circumstance, not by choice. And I'm finding more and more of the younger generation of women who are talking about freezing their eggs, having surrogates to carry their babies or, or going on fertility treatment with or without being in a committed relationship. Because they're being told that their degrees won't keep them warm at night or look after them when they're old. They also hear the regret of those who didn't want to have children out of wedlock. And since Mr. Wright didn't arrive, they're now being judged for not having had children. The joke is clearly on all of us. You can't win, nor can you avoid the judgment, regardless of your choice. If you are a prominent woman and you're unmarried, woe to you if you choose a younger man. That makes you a lonely cougar being used by a young boy. If you date an older man, you're desperate and can't find anyone your own age. If you date someone your own age, but you earn more than him, it's again desperation and wanting to wear the pants in the house. Others in seemingly happy marriages are in a constant battle to manage the power dynamics. This sometimes even includes partners who seek to impregnate, the, to impregnate their career wives or girlfriends with the hope that a baby will domesticate them. How many of us have not been in an argument with our significant partners and we're told, I'm not in your courtroom, I'm not your secretary, as a way of rebuking the fact that they don't, that you don't agree with something they did or said. Some of us are verbally or emotionally abused, which includes serial and public cheating to signal to society that this wife of mine or this girlfriend of mine may, may be powerful at work, but she's not in control at home. And when insecure men lack the financial ability to control women and the verbal and emotional abuse is no longer working, it can quickly escalate to threats and violence. And career women are not immune to this violence. It's even possible that violence in prominent households is more likely to be covered up to avoid scandal and reputational damage. When or if she leaves, the shaming continues. There must be something wrong with her. She neglected him. That's why he cheated. She was too argumentative or disrespectful. That's why he beat her. She provoked him. That's why he killed her. It's always something the woman has done or has failed to do. And this logic affirms that while the Overton window may have shifted, the objectification of women hasn't. We are damned if we work. We are damned if we don't. Shamed if we are single. Shamed if we are divorced. Shamed for being bad mothers. And shamed for not having children. That's the cost I'm talking about. These aren't quantifiable structural issues that I'm referring to. I'm, I'm sorry, my, my computer seems to be trying to uh, shut down while I'm talking. So technology, while it's a great thing, can also be a, an inconvenient thing. So, so let me get back to you. These aren't quantifiable structural issues, but they are real barriers which impact the career choices we make to satisfy the long laundry list of unrealistic societal demands. These are barriers that shape our choices on our career advancement and the opportunities that we're willing to take. And I'm sure the legal profession understands these issues. Why do we have so few female litigators and so many female company secretaries? Do women not work hard enough? Is it because we have a pesky habit of falling pregnant and need to take maternity leave? Is it because we're too emotional and can't handle pressure? Be careful. This is the slippery slope of having unrealistic expectations and not providing conducive environments and then engaging in victim blaming. In the old days, professions like mining 
managed to excuse the exclusion of women by claiming mining as a physically tough environment that's not suitable for women. What reason does the legal profession have to accept gendered blind spots and normalize the overrepresentation of women in roles like company secretaries, legal advisors, and compliance officers? Why are the aspects of the legal profession, including space on the judicial bench, that remain dominated by men? Is it because women aren't ambitious enough? They don't work hard enough? I think you see the trap by now. Don't blame the oppressed, change the oppression. Sometimes we can't even blame the law. I was told of a female lawyer here in Namibia who ran a one woman law firm and she had her water break while she was in court. Another one got labor pains while she was in office and I myself left and drove myself to the hospital from the government attorney's office and gave birth to my daughter two hours later. Why do we do this? Our labor laws do provide for maternity leave, and, but because our circumstances were such that we didn't get to choose that, we were compelled to work until the last possible moment. And once we delivered, we needed to get back to work as much sooner than women who have employers and we have employer funded maternity benefits because if we don't work, we don't get paid. This barrier doesn't fall neatly within a structural barrier. My male counterpart who runs a one man law firm who also makes babies does not need to go through this. When his spouse is pregnant, his revenue is not threatened. The playing field is not even. Even when it comes to something like networking or, or mentoring, Women must consider power dynamics and societal judgment that men are protected from. I was the founding managing director and a founding shareholder of the first private equity fund in Namibia. Naturally, my key function was to chase equity deals and I needed a strong network to do that. I assume many female lawyers on this call need to chase fees. For all of us, male or female, chasing deals or fees needs us to network. It's not a choice. The difference again, is that the playing field is not even. Lots of networking in the investment management industry were late nights, events at night on the golf course or hunting and fishing trips over the weekend. And too often, these events were alcohol fueled with mostly men present. These are difficult environments for both single and married women. You try and avoid the judgment and rumors by rather taking clients out for lunch, but in the this, excuse me, the first thing that happens is that the waiter, when he brings the bill, he takes it to your client because he assumes it's the man who must be paying. And it always makes for an awkward end to a client lunch. When um, the same is true with a rumor mongering, you think you avoid the rumor mongering by staying away from the evening events and really sticking to lunches, but the rumors persist. You were seen having lunch with X or Y, therefore, very obvious, you must be having an affair. I'm not sure why society constantly puts women in these impossible choices. As I said before, these are difficult environments and it's almost impossible to explain to people that I'm chasing deals, not men. And oddly enough, the same awkward scenario plays out with mentorship requests. I was a shareholder and ran the only private equity fund in Namibia. I wasn't the first woman or the first black woman to run a private equity fund in Namibia. I was the first to run a private equity fund in Namibia. I found it odd that initially only young women were inspired by my career enough to seek guidance and mentorship. I often wondered if men felt they didn't have anything to learn from me. And it's only when our investment portfolio kept growing that men realized that I was a key resource in understanding for them to understand and enter the private equity space. And only then did they actively seek out my guidance as readily as young women sought it. And once that hurdle was overcome, there was a second hurdle of again, managing perceptions. You want to mentor men, but you must be a bit more caged around your male mentees to ensure that it did not come at a reputational cost. After all, you are already being accused of sleeping your way to the top. And now you're adding a new charge of luring young men. What is the cost of not being able to mentor or to freely build a corporate network? 
we lose opportunities to shape young male professionals to view women as professional role models, while simultaneously also losing the opportunity to build the, ne to build the next networks which enable us to advance our careers. We are also happy that Kenya has appointed a, a female chief justice as it gives us hope that we will see more gender representative judicial benches across the continent. We also know the financial cost that it takes to leave the private sector, to leave, sorry, private practice for the bench. Imagine the cost for a woman who was likely earning less than her male counterparts in the legal profession. Many of these men who leverage their networks to write great fees, sit on lucrative boards, secure legal work, and, and often many of them are becoming part-time businessmen while also being lawyers. And I raise this for the same reason I raise the impact of relationships. I want to highlight that being an African woman is costly in ways that are difficult to quantify and to articulate and that this cost often prevents us from being able to take up certain roles. It's even difficult to speak about how career limiting something that sounds as simple as gossip and public opinion can be for women. In the private sector, I remember that the most consistent stereotype I encountered, particularly when you're young and, an, and on an upward trajectory, is that you must have slipped your way to the top. Obviously, you can't because you worked hard. I was the first female chairperson of a commercial bank. So I don't remember anyone having the cognitive dissonance, dissonance required to claim that I was a gold digger. I also don't remember too many opinions about how I dressed as my outfits were usually a dark jacket with a matching pants skirt or dress. I mentioned this because when I became first lady, the custodians of patriarchy who are based on social media did not take kindly to my boring and often repeated outfits nor did they like my hair always being in braids. And these were many men who participated in these conversations. And I notice it's mostly in politics that I see such a, a disrespectful focus on how a woman dresses. I would understand if this was limited to a first lady's appearance because as, as spouses of presidents, ours is indeed an ambiguous role and it is linked to the position of our spouse. So one can almost understand the crude objectification but how do we explain and understand that female presidents and high level female politicians and, and, and political candidates go through the same ridiculous scrutiny of how they are dressed? Also, it was only when I got married to a politician that I got called a gold digger. So let's aggregate the insults here. Private sector, you're a bad mother, bad wife, you're too aggressive, you love power, you love money, and you slipped your way to the top. Public sector, you're a gold digger, you dress poorly, you're a bad mother and wife, and you must learn to keep quiet and, and look prettier. Different sectors, same tactics of utilizing shame and judgment to force conformity with normative societal values. Part of the reason I decided to do that Choose to Challenge video on International Women's Day is I recognize that we need to speak more truthfully about our experiences. As Audrey Lord said, our silence does not protect us. It only protects perpetrators. When we speak, it gives others the cover to also speak their truth. If we don't speak the truth, our challenges will never be fully understood or addressed, nor will they be taken seriously. I'm not naive about the pushback that often accompanies standing up against bullies. Many women can't say some of the things I'm able to say because there are consequences for them. It may be off-putting to their major client or to their employer. It may have financial or societal implications. And I felt that I had been called so many names that it really didn't make a difference what they would call me after releasing that video. When we don't speak truthfully about our journeys, our counterparts don't understand our challenges. And other women think that their challenges are the exception and that perhaps there might be something wrong with them because why does it look like other women aren't going through what I'm going through? If we knew how many of us face the same challenges, it may just trigger the momentum required to change things. We do not have 135.6 years to wait for the social and political acceptance that the Overton window talks about. Our workplaces and homes are a reflection of the societies we live in. 
And as we wait for a shift in societal mindsets, those of us who operate outside of these normative values and embedded social and power structures will continue to be shamed and silenced in an effort to act and speak or in an effort to force us to act and speak in conformity with the status quo. After all, what more do women actually want? The laws are there. Nobody is stopping you from advancing your career. Just work harder. But the question remains unanswered. What is it that we want as women? Because our needs are very different. But I certainly do have a few wants. And one of the things I want is more male voices to speak up. I've seen how a man who goes onto my Twitter timeline and who assists the woman in castigating misogynists has an impact. One of the first emails I got was from a high level male entrepreneur. I, I, I think he's based in Ghana, sat on many boards across the continent and has investments all over Africa. And he thanked me for my message and summarized his understanding of the abuse that I was reflecting on by saying, it says a lot about our society and how men allow this to happen to women. It's time to speak up and to change this. I was so gratified by his and many other emails I received because he understood the power of being an ally. And this is the importance of speaking our truth, even when there's pushback. There are reasonable people who are listening. This is how mindsets are changed and allies are built. Secondly, I'd like to see the enforcement of labor law protections including being protected from sexual harassment and violence in the workplace. I don't know about other countries, but I know that in Namibia, cases of sexual harassment in the workplace never make it to court. They are usually settled within the workplace. Sometimes, not often, the perpetrator is fired, but it's very few that these cases make it to court. They do need to start making it to court. We need protection from sexual harassment and violence in the workplace. We need to be protected from pay gaps and, and enabled with child-friendly policies and maternity benefits, which aren't solely funded by the employer. We also need these policies to be gender neutral so that those men who don't need an award to look after their own children can also do so with the protection of the law extended to them. Thirdly, I'd like to see more country-specific data that backs the anecdotal evidence we usually present in speeches like these. Not enough research is being done on the differing dimensions of gender inequality and how it impacts different women. Fourthly, I'd like us to re-examine the assumption that economic empowerment is the panacea to women's empowerment. Financial stability is certainly constructive, but it's not the golden wand that wipes away all the problematic mindsets and, and rigid social norms which impact our relationships nor does it change the structural and institutional barriers which constrain our advancement. My fifth point is that we need to be intentional about extending our networks and mentoring both male and female mentees. This is all of us, male and female professions, uh, professionals. This is the only way we can shape future generations. We need men who have no sexual interest in us, who are willing to sponsor our careers and as sponsors to guide, share lessons, and speak up for their sponsees when they are not in the room. To speak up when a promotion for a capable woman is being discussed, but the fact that she just got married and is likely to try and have a child is counted against her. To help her with context so she can expand her network. Six, we need to be more intentional about gender representation whether it's on a judicial service commission, whether it's on the bench, whether it's a law society or the boards we sit on, we do, we do need to start asking, where are the women? Why are we not more representative? Seven, we need to stop being so judgmental. We need to remove shame from our toolbox of how we deal with women. It's said that when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. The same is true with misogyny. Every time a woman fails to conform to the normative, shame is the only tool used to mold her back into form. The insults and shaming has to stop from all of us. And I include us women, as we too 
deploy harmful gendered stereotypes against each other. We slut, we slut shame each other and deploy the same misogynistic tools to police other women. The conformity of a misogynistic woman is rewarded with being treated like she's different from those who don't conform and who do dare to challenge power relations. You're a good woman, a real African woman. You are different from those wild westernized ones. Divide and rule. That was very much the strategy used by those who colonized our countries. Don't be fooled. They don't think you're different. We are all the same to a misogynist. Eight, we need friendlier workplaces and professions that accommodate our needs and which reconfigure how merit looks like. Workplaces that understand our unique challenges. As we can't shoulder the burdens of unrealistic societal expectations on our own, we need support. Another one that I want to talk about as number nine is we need to open the Overton window for fresh air. We need to normalize ideas of women's agency, women leaving violent and problematic men and accepting women who don't conform to restrictive norms, both within and outside the home, including lesbian women, women who are not what we regard as what a woman should be. How reconfigured gender relations will look like will be context specific as what we will regard as healthy gender norms in our workplace or homes will differ. But the idea, some things are entirely unacceptable. In our workplaces, we need to eliminate violence, emotional or financial abuse, pay inequity, discrimination. These aren't matters of opinion these things have to stop. And then my last point is we need to protect our children. We need to realize that childhood trauma is consequential and it shapes our adult perceptions and our choices, whether it's being subjected to sexual violence or witnessing or experiencing domestic violence or substance abuse from our parents. It's harmful, it's deeply traumatic and we do not protect our children by staying in hostile marriages, we harm them. Related to this, we need to engage the predatory behavior of men. To be more specific, men who prey on younger women who seek their guidance, support, and mentorship in a professional environment. It's harmful, it must stop. Instead of shaming sexual predators at home or in the workplace, we shame women who refuse to accept that as a norm. We we shame them for not being married. We shame them for being single. We shame them for having too many consensual relationships. But we always forget to shame men who don't understand or respect consent or sexual agency. Men who rape, harass, and harm women with no consequence. They are the ones who need to be shamed and held accountable by the law and by society, not protected. I've spent the afternoon painting with a very broad brush I appreciate that our paths, perceptions and experiences will be different, but our commitment for an equal world and equal society should be the same. From my own experience, the path to the top was often lonely and confusing. There were many unwritten rules that you found out the hard way. The guilt was also always there, the shame, the self-doubt, the self-limiting behavior. It was right there with the joys of success, the prestige, the money, the confidence, the power. There are those who've turned around on this journey and said, I can't do this. It's too costly for me. Others have continued and still had their success questioned and downplayed. Every time a child struggles, a mother will wonder if it's because she didn't spend enough time at home when that child was young. We should not be in these positions. We should be able to enjoy our success in the same way our male, our male counterparts enjoy theirs. I have no doubt that our societies will eventually expand and we will achieve gender equity. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what happens in the meantime. The law has and will create more opportunities and lawyers are uniquely positioned 
to play a leading role in ensuring just and equitable societies, as they always have. And as we have benefited from those who fought colonial oppression and racism, let us collectively fight oppression in all its forms and not just the oppression that directly impacts us. Thank you once again for the opportunity to share my candid views on the issue of gender equality. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. That was a wonderful speech and you certainly spoke to my heart in terms of issues such as the fact that all forms of oppression are bad and should be condemned. That uh, self-censorship um, can be a challenge to women that they should push back on that. Um, you spoke to the challenges of the working woman, the need for labor laws that are more supportive of working women, and the fact that gender representation matters. Um, we'd now like to uh, open the floor. Uh, for those of you who'd like to ask the First Lady some questions, uh, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, please post your questions in there. I see we already have some questions, so I'll get straight into it. First Lady, are you ready? Yes, I am. Excellent. So our first question is from Sarah Wachira. She says, great discussion and awesome lecture with First Lady Monica. My question is, what are some of the collective solutions we as women can start to make a difference for the future generations of women, no matter how hard the discussions or uncomfortable they may be? Um, I'll take three at, at a time and then, then you can respond. Uh, so the next one is, have you experienced being teared down at the workplace by a fellow woman who is in leadership? This is from Jacqueline Omol. And if so, how did you overcome that? And the last of the three questions is from Judge Bubile Shonga from Zambia. And she says, all protocols observed, some women discourage each other from using a right or entitlement designed and passed for women. This is because they will be considered as weak. Uh, should we not be encouraging each other? Why fight for rights and then discourage application? For example, not taking maternity leave uh, and come, come back as soon as you can. Uh, maybe I'd also like to mention that in Zambia, we have a Mother's Day, which is optional once one day a week, uh, a month, sorry, that women have often opt out of. So maybe that's the context within which she's speaking. So just to take those three uh, questions for the moment, and um, we look forward to your responses. So let me start with Sarah um, and her question on the collective solutions that we as women start to make a difference for the future generations of women. Um, and I think it starts with those, those of us who have daughters. Um, there's nothing more important than, than protecting the confidence of your child. And, and there is a confidence gap that emerges between boys and girls at around the age of 10. I, I certainly saw it with my daughter. She was confident and she was bubbly and she was happy. And around about that time, she became a little bit quieter. She didn't open up as much. And I think that was the same time that society started to realize her, her boobs are growing and she's becoming a girl. And that was the same time that the body shaming started. So, so we need to protect the confidence of our daughters and not only women need to do that. I think men need to do that as well. The, the, the second part, Sarah, is I think we need to be more intentional about mentoring younger women, supporting them, but also being honest about our challenges and how we dealt with them. I don't think we open up enough and I know it's a trust issue, but we need to be more honest about some of the challenges we faced to help young women, especially young professional women, avoid the mistakes we've made because many of us have made exp expensive mistakes because we certainly didn't have um, that guidance. The third part, especially around networking, is I've seen firsthand how kitchen cabinets, even though they named kitchen cabinets, how they lack women, how the inner circle of a head of state 
the one that influences his perceptions and his views, his inner circle, that kitchen cabinet lacks women. So these little boys club networks that, that influence one another and shape opportunities lack representation, but I'm not seeing girls networks. I'm not seeing female keep kitchen cabinets where we sit together, strategize, discuss things, discuss opportunities and advancements. So I think we need to also be a little bit more intentional about building our own networks as well as tapping into male networks that are inclusive. So there's a number of things that we can talk about collectively, uh, but I, I, I don't want to make the responsibility of shaping future generations of, 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 of young women, the sole responsibility of older women. I think we all have this responsibility. Uh, men are very quick to remind us, yes, we have mothers, we have wives, we have daughters, <laughs> but the behavior is not changing. So we exceptionalize those who we love and continue to treat those who we don't know differently. Um, then I'll quickly speak to Jacqueline's question of, have I been experienced being torn down in the workplace by a fellow woman who's in leadership? Um, the, the, the interesting thing is, Jacqueline, is when I entered the investment management space in Namibia, it was very white male dominated. Um, I have not had a female boss. Um, no, I actually haven't. Um, even the boards I sat on were primarily men. Um, but I do know it's the lived experience of many of my female friends where they often are challenged by that. Um, and, and we had a, a discussion recently. Um, uh, Madame Ellen Johnson Salif has uh, founded what she calls the Amuje Center, which does mentorship for young women. And one of the suggestions there was is it possible to have a conflict resolution mechanism as part of centers like hers? where if I'm challenged by a female leader who's in the public domain, where a, a, a neutral, non-judgmental platform where I can go and share my challenge and they bring us together and we discuss what the issue is because sometimes we're not supportive towards one another and we don't even realize we're not being supportive. And, and, and maybe it's something I've done to trigger the lack of support, but whatever it is, it often needs an impartial, non-judgmental third party who brings us uh, together. So it's it, it's not my personal experience, but I know it's a it's it's a it's a it's an experience of many women who I know who have had female bosses who were not supportive, um, which really goes into um, the question of our, our judge from Zambia about some of us who discourage one another from taking full benefits, don't do it that way, do it this way. I remember when I um, got quite a big appointment, a woman who I really looked up to took me out to lunch because she wanted to guide me. And her concern at that point is I used to walk into meetings um, with my nails not done. My, if you can see, my nails are still <laughs> done. <laughs> and uh, she was really concerned as well that I never carried a handbag. And after this lunch, I thought, wow, there's so many things that she could have shared with me, but she was concerned about my appearance. And I think maybe some of her concerns were maybe valid. Maybe that's the society we live in where these things do have an impact. But I felt that was a wasted opportunity to mentor and guide me. Um, and my, 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 my response to that, what do we do when we start discouraging each other? Some of us need to be a bit brave. I've, I've, I've sat in many board meetings um, and my children, got used to being the last kids to be picked up from school because I was always late. Um, uh, and very quickly I realized, but I can't always be given the silent treatment by my kids because they're upset that they're the last kids to be picked up and it, it wasn't safe. So what I started to do at about quarter to one, I'll tell the board that uh, we're going to need to adjourn at one o'clock. I need to go and get my kids. And I didn't want my assistant to do it because my assistant was also a mother and she had her own kids to pick up. And I noticed the moment I said, we need to adjourn this board meeting because I need to go pick up kids. Everybody else went running out of the door to go pick up their kids. So there we are all in a board meeting. All of our kids are sitting at school uncollected, but nobody's brave enough to say, this is what we have to do. 
So I think some of us must take the lead, especially people who are in more powerful positions like judges, like senior counsels, to take the lead and be open and say, why don't you take maternity leave? Why are you coming back so, uh, earlier? Because then you give permission to those who don't have the power and authority that you have to act within their rights that are given to them. Because when we discourage and, and, and make it seem as if it's career limiting, that's the reality that we create. So we can fight these realities by especially women who are in more powerful positions, setting the example, adjourning board meetings at one, um, encouraging women to take maternity leave, and you yourself, if you fall pregnant, to set the example, if it's not financially costly to you, to, to take the full spectrum of your maternity leave, because the next woman will do the same. Thank you, Madam First Lady. Uh, the next set of questions are as follows. Sarah Shaumbwako says, thank you for an encouraging speech. From now on, the sky is the limit. What keeps you going, Madam Gengos? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a question from Ruth Chun. First Lady Gengos, it is an honor to hear you speak. Can you provide suggestions on how those with privilege can be allies and facilitate change. Ruth Chun is from Canada, formerly of Namibia's ENS Africa and Hollard. Laura Alakaija from Nigeria says, how did you navigate the tendency for colleagues to assign perceived gender roles to you because you are female? And given the, 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 the number of questions that are racking up, I'm gonna take another one which is uh, from Felicity or War says, how do we break the barriers as we as women create for each other? Can we have national spaces to start this conversation in Namibia? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Sarah, I don't know what keeps me going. It's it's different things um, every day. I, I, I'm, I'm inspired by small things and I'm inspired by people around me. Um, and I think what also keeps me going is that I'm, I'm a naturally uh, positive person who always tries to find the best in every situation. Um, Ruth, I did think your, your name sounded familiar. Um, and I think it's an important question you ask about privilege. So, and I can only reflect on my own experience as a first lady because every single title I've ever had was earned. Um, the first lady title was the first one that was unearned. And um, I think with unearned privilege comes great responsibility. And that's why I often push difficult conversations because part of the social capital that I don't deserve, but which I have enables me and protects me from pushing difficult conversations. Um, I, for instance, can say all manner of things and I'll, I'll be called all kinds of horrible names. But interestingly, as a first lady, I've never, for instance, been threatened with violence, but I know female journalists are being threatened with violence. Mm -hmm. So how we use our privilege Ruth, is we must speak up for others. Um, it's, 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 it's soul destroying when you under attack um, in the media, on social media, and everybody's just quiet. Um, there's nothing more valuable than powerful privileged people speaking up on behalf of those who can't. Um, Laura, how do you navigate the tendency for colleagues to assign perceived gender roles to you because you're female? So I don't drink coffee. And the reason I don't is because I realized very quickly people wanted me to make their coffee in the boardroom. So I just decided I don't drink coffee, so you must make your own coffee. <laughs> um, and for instance, you'd be in the boardroom and the minute taker isn't there and, and you'd be told, oh, Monica, you take such great minutes. Why don't you take the minutes? And I'm a board member. I'm not the minute taker. Now I can't participate in this board meeting because I must focus on taking minutes. So I'll just jokingly say, no, I'm not taking minutes. I'm bad at taking minutes. So you actually start to tell lies because you don't want to say that. Why should I take minutes? Why don't you take minutes? Um, so, so I would navigate it through a mixture of diplomacy and humor, but it was very rare for me just to say, no, I'm not going to do it. Why don't, why don't you do it? And maybe we should be more truthful and say, but why don't we get a minute taker? Well, I'm a board member and I need to participate in this meeting and it's not constructive. 
Um, so I think we, we need to be a little bit more truthful and it goes back to Ruth's comment as well. Maybe the, the more powerful amongst us must also not request that women do these household chores in the workplace. And that includes men because they often have an expectation that we become their work wives, not in a sexual way, but that we must take care of these menial tasks and, and, and we must all speak against that. Um, Felicity um, is asking, how do we break the barriers we as women create for each other? And can we have national spaces to start this conversation in Namibia? I think we can and we should. Um, but I also know that the, the space for professional women in Namibia is small. And for us to have very frank conversations about what I go through, Felicity, what you go through at the Ministry of Justice is you need to trust me. I need to not go and run my mouth about, wow, that Felicity looks like she's got it all together, but she's struggling with her husband. So we need to also keep the information that we share in these type of networks um, confidential. There's nothing worse than being in these networks. You discuss something that's personal, either at your workplace or in your home. Um, and within a week, it's a topic of conversation um, in different circles. So we can break these barriers, Felicity, and we do need to create these national spaces, but we must do it with an understanding that we must protect each other and the, the, the stories that we share in these type of spaces. Thank you. Uh, I'll go through to our next set of questions. Um, the first is from Mercy. Mercy Gilbert, Ambassador of Ambassador UK of Hera's, Hera Women's Global Empowerment Organization. We have a lot of women as ambassadors, but what advice would you give to women to get into leadership positions and how, and how they make the world a better place for women in leadership? Yeah. The second is from Aubrey Ndandula. Madam First Lady, my view is women should not focus on being given an upper hand because they are mothers, but strive for equilibrium and compete competitively. I for one appreciate women that stand out on merit. The next is from Vez Hindu. Uh, actually this, um, Vez has two questions. Does the, first, does the Honorable First Lady still have a mentorship program open to young women wishing to be mentored in Namibia, in Namibia? And how does one partake in it? And secondly, is there an option available to young women who wish to be mentors through this program? Uh, um, you could take those questions, please. Okay, so I'll start with Mercy. Um, and uh, what advice would I have to women who get into leadership positions? Um, and, I, and, and I'm talking from the perspective of her being this representative for this, um, this Women Globals Empowerment Organization that has so many um, ambassadors and I assume female ambassadors. Um, and one thing that I've seen is Again, that kitchen cabinet story. I've, I've, I've seen how um, male ambassadors relate differently to their principles, to their appointing authority that female ambassadors do um, when they come to country to visit. They make a point of checking in and just making sure that they're still on the radar. And I'm not sure why female ambassadors don't do that. Um, I think we are too concerned about perceptions and how it uh, will be seen and whether we're being intrusive. Um, and I can <laughs> guarantee you men are not concerned about being intrusive or how it's seen. And I think we should be less concerned about that. Um, and, and, and women do make a better, good female leaders do make the world a better place. And so there is a, a disclaimer there. Um, Aubrey, women should not focus on being given an upper hand because they are mothers. We should strive for equilibrium. So Aubrey, I think we can only strive for equilibrium when the playing field is even. When the playing field is not even, it's not easy to talk about equilibrium. Um, and that is true for women who are mothers. Um, 
and I understand and I respect the challenges of, of women who who don't have children or, or women who um, are not working because our challenges are different. But I, I, I do think that it's um, an impossible ask to ask women who are mothers to operate at the same level as somebody who's not a mother. And I think we need to be sensitive about that. Um, and, and, and thank you for the work you do, um, Aubrey, with the um, reusable sanitary towels that you support for, um, for adolescent girls. But we all need to do our bit in different spaces and we all have different realities. And then Vez Hinjo is asking about whether I have a mentorship program um, for young women and is there an option? Oh, uh, Vez, that's such a difficult question. Mentorship done right is time intensive and I, I, I don't always have the time. I do have male and female mentees and we have structured meetings um, at least once a month. Um, and I don't take many because I do feel it needs to be time limited, sometimes six months to a year, but I need to be focused. And it's a relationship issue and a trust issue that needs to be developed. So often what I do try and do when there are events or where there's um, opportunities for engagement, I do try and find um, young people, male and female, in networks to invite them so that they can be privy to conversations um, and where they do have an opportunity to, to, to access me or my network. And I'm very generous with my network. Um, many young people, for instance, want to be net, better networked in the financial sector or in the legal profession. And I'll go out of my way to try and help them find um, those networks and those opportunities. Thank you very much. Um, are you happy to continue with the questions? Yes, I am. Okay, great. So uh, an anonymous um, question. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Oh, no, it's not anonymous. It's from Greenwell Yempe. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. It's a wonderful presentation, I must admit. My question is, as First Lady of the Great Republic of Namibia, how much influence does your office have to ensure that the government of the Republic of Namibia makes laws which ensure that women's lives are uplifted. Then we do have an anonymous question here. Let me read it. Thank you, First Lady, for your excellent presentation. What is your view of those who castigate judicial officers and women lawyers for being feminists simply because they are addressing a generational problem where women are treated unequally, especially in uh, SGBV matters. Uh, then Iabode Uguniran, I think it's from Nigeria, says in Nigeria, women representation in political offices continues to thin out. What can we do about it? And lastly, because we're racking up the questions, Amila, Lang, Am Amila Young, this is Zambian, says, Thank you, First Lady, for a valuable and enlightening lecture, which in some, which literally brought me to tears of, of recognition. As a legal professional from Zambia, a widowed mother of four girls who's been living and working in the UK for nearly 20 years, I have faced and continue to face many of the barriers you have highlighted in your speech. Often the challenges I face have not been understood by my European counterparts, male and female, such as the needs to provide not only for my children, but for less fortunate members of my extended family back home in Zambia. What can we do to highlight these challenges for our sisters in the diaspora who face these difficulties in an already challenging environment? Thank you. If you could take those, please. Thank you. Okay. Um... So what does my office do to influence the government? My office should and must never try to um, influence government because I think um, we talk a lot in Namibia about systems, processes and institutions. And when a first lady has, uh, I'm unelected. The, the, the public did not elect me to decide on what laws and policies should be passed. Um, I think that's the role of cabinet. That's the role 
um, of the systems, processes, and institutions that are established. So that said, I must uh, give credit to Namibia that we are very serious about making sure that our laws, um, whether it's about property rights, whether it's about uh, maternity leave, um, are really in favor of women. Our challenge in Namibia is not necessarily legal or, or uh, legislative, it's societal. Um, so that's a quick answer, uh, Greenwell. Um, and then to um, the anonymous attendee who wants to know about being judi judicial officers who are being called feminists because um, they are addressing generational problems where treat women are treated unequally in SGBV matters. Um, interestingly enough, I get called a feminist simply because I talk about these issues. And, and the word feminist has now been weaponized to portray women as angry and we hate men and, and we are divisive. So the moment you speak against the status quo, you must be a feminist. Um, and and I'm, I'm not sure where the word became weaponized to be such a swear word that even women try and distance themselves from the word and say, no, 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 I'm not a feminist. I actually just believe in women's empowerment. Well, that's the essence of, of, of feminism. So we need to de-weaponize the word firstly. And, and, and secondly, the attitude of judicial officers towards issues that impact women do have consequences. Um, a female lawyer shared with me that um, she once was in an informal setting with a judge and he made a comment, he doesn't understand why women divorce over adultery. Now, you won't convince me that this judge's personal views don't impact how he understands and interprets the law. Um, so our, our, our lived experience is very important and you shouldn't worry uh, yourself with labels like you being a feminist. You must do what the law enables you to do to advance the cause of women. And then when it comes to what the body is asking about uh, women's representation in political offices, I understand why it's thinning out um, in many African countries. Um, I've, I've, I've had a bird's eye view, for instance, on how expensive it is to campaign and how much more expensive it is for women, just and, and not just from a financial perspective, the the insults, the the, the the threats, the whether you have family support or not, because not everybody's husband wants to see their wife being insulted and humiliated every day on the front page of, of newspapers. How Namibia has resolved it is that the ruling party has um, has has brought about a quota system where they do a zebra style um, list for parliamentary representation. And that overnight doubled um, our representation of women in the political space. And, and I think that was good. So we, we must talk and think about, uh, about quotas. And, and I can already hear my friend Audrey saying, no, but it must be merit-based. Why do we only talk about merit-based when it comes to women's representation? I know a lot mm -hmm. of incompetent male politicians who've made it into parliament. And I'm not saying women should also be incompetent, but I'm saying that we should be judged by the same standards. And, and, and I'm also saying that without the quota system, it's gonna take us forever to get um, uh, representation for, of women in political spaces. And I'm, <laughs> I'm a bit more careful about this topic because I have seen women in political spaces who do not use their proximity to power to advance the cause of women. If anything, they embrace misogynistic views and they actually actively fight against uh, issues of reproductive health, issues um, of benefits towards women in the workplace. And, and those women I'm very careful about. But, but let us rather deal with them once they're there than to create barriers for their entry into the political space. Um, and Amila, thank you so much for your, for your kind remarks. Um, and the issue of uh, extended family members and our, our duty to provide for them, I think often it gets called black tax. Um, and this I think impacts um, male and female Africans um, where we do need to remit um, money either from overseas or from the urban centers in which we live to our, our relatives in rural areas. 
Um, and you're right, and that's also been my experience where my white counterparts don't understand um, that obligation that we have towards our family members. And, and I think we do need to talk about these issues of black tax more openly. Um, and it's a, it's a historical concept rooted in our uh, unemployment in black communities is higher than in white communities. Um, we have less financially stable relatives who can help out with these. So the more affluent member of the family does shoulder um, a, a high burden um, of financial cost relative to the uh, white counterpart in the workplace. And I think by talking openly about these things, maybe this is the only way that they'll understand it. And if they're not listening to you, Amila Young um, from Zambia, who's working in the UK, then maybe they'll listen to me, Monica Kenkos, who's a first lady, but I have the same experience as you, um, Amila. It probably is worse for me because the day I became first lady, um, everybody in my village became my family member. So <laughs> um, it's not easy. Um, Linda, I'm trying to see, did we go beyond a Miller or are you gonna take over from here? Uh, no, we did not go beyond a Miller. Um, so the next question is from Vuyanzi R was asking a question about self-care. What do you do for your own self-care? Uh, Senzeni Wamundila, I think that's from Zambia, says a timely discussion. Um, how do we overcome the fact that men have no confidence when we set up networks where women can have these conversations? Uh, Susio's question has been answered about the quotas. Um, Tanya McCartney from the Bahamas says, um, can you share some business networking strategies if golf and evening drinks are not your cup of tea? And uh, Crystal Whippy from New Zealand says, thank you so much for your detailed analysis of misogyny and the unacceptable nature of all, all forms of discrimination. Here in the South Pacific, we also have strong patriarchal structures in most places. And a lot of that was further strengthened through colonialism, especially misusing religious beliefs introduced by the colonizers. Do you have any suggestions on how to reach out to those in society who are deeply ingrained into the patriarchy, bolstered by their religious beliefs and turn them into, into allies. Uh, I think I'll stop there for now. Okay. Um, we, where did we start there? Was it with- um, Self-care. Um, Vuyanzi. Um, so my self-care Vuyanzi is, um, I don't go near Facebook and uh, I regulate my Twitter usage because I've got a personal Twitter account, which I man myself. And what I do is I check out. Um, I take two week breaks and I go in, I kind of peep and then I'm out again for two weeks. Um, another form of self care for me is the same as what I do on social media. Um, I check out where I find toxic people or environments. Uh, and I can do that. Not everybody has the option to do that. Um, and uh, I, um, it's, it's, it's unfortunately Afrikaans saying, and I don't know what the English equivalent is, but I've, I've learned Vuyanzi that sometimes calling quits on things that don't serve you, people who don't serve you is important. I've, um, I've, I've, I've never really seen someone leave a toxic relationship, whether it's a friendship or a marriage or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a toxic workplace and say, I should have stayed longer. Most of them say I should have left earlier. So, so my form of self-care is I do careful audits of the people around me um, when I don't believe they're not providing me in an environment where I can either be myself or where I feel safe and protected. Um, who was next? Because I, I saw Linda, you skipped a few. I did, sorry. <laughs> um, should I just go down the list or should yes, I? Yes, please, yes, please. 
I think uh, there was the strategy on networking, if golf okay, and drinks are not, yeah. Um, I, I think sometimes, and I say this respectfully, um, is we shouldn't center the views of men so much in how we approach things. Um, so if you want to set up a, a strong and powerful female network, go about and set up a strong and powerful female network. Get strong and powerful women as part of it, but also get younger women as part of it. Get um, diversity, get, get, make sure you have white women in it, make sure you have lesbian women in it, make sure you, there are women from rural areas um, who are determined uh, about their advancement. Make sure that it's an inclusive um, and safe space and don't concern yourself too much with those who, who don't agree. Because as I said, when I was talking, we must base our actions and what we say and what we do based on how will the reasonable average person understand it. And I think we pay too much attention to the unreasonable person um, and how they perceive the work that we do. Um, do I believe in gender quotas? Susia, yes, I do. Um, simple answer. Tanya from the Bahamas, can I share some business networking strategies if golf and evening drinks are not your cup of tea? So I always used to do lunches and I was very good at managing um, phone conversations. So if I noticed, for instance, that somebody was promoted or they said something in the public domain that was perhaps controversial, or that I agreed with, I'd send them an email or a text message and I say, I really agree um, with what you said, or I'd use my social media uh, platform to, 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 to defend um, the attack that they under, um, or I'd never fail in sending a small inexpensive birthday gift or a congratulations gift or a condolence message because all of that are forms of networking because to me networking um, is staying in touch um, i would make sure that if there were industry events um, like brian said earlier the problem now with COVID and technology you don't kind of get to hang around and chit chat um, so that's what i would use industry forums for to kind of just hang around and, and, and chit chat and, and take a genuine interest um, in the lives of people. And I've got this thing where I can remember what you told me four years ago about your daughter quitting ballet and, and starting squash. So when I do see you four years later, uh, I will ask you, so how's the squash going? And people are always impressed that you actually remember the detail. And, and sometimes how I remember the detail on the back of people's cards, I'll say, um, Tanya, her daughter is a hockey player. So when I see Tanya McCartney again, I'll, I'll, I'll have made a note that Tanya's from the Bahamas, her child plays hockey. And Tanya, how's your, your child doing? Um, and that's how you keep a conversation uh, current. Uh, Jacqueline, who's asking about my kids who are always last uh, to be collected from school and, and missing um, squash uh, competitions and hockey matches. Um, how did you deal with the disappointment and fear and resentment from your children and probably husband and society at large? And if you were to go back in time and would you change anything, um, what would you have done different in terms of balancing work and home life and still pursue your leadership roles in society? That's such a difficult question, um, Jacqueline. And I think managing the the resentment, the for the domestic resentment and, and accusations, but but mommy, why am I the only child whose mom didn't come to the parents' teachers' meeting or who doesn't sell hot dogs on on on, on Saturdays? Um, is by being open to the kids um, about what my aspirations and my ambitions are and why I I do spend so much time um, at the office. I remember I once took a three-month sabbatical, uh, Jacqueline. And I, I it, it, it was within a month of being this mother who was dropping her kids and attending the school things. The kids were like, mommy, please find yourself something to do. You're frustrating us because we've gotten used to um, kind of figuring these things out yourself. So, so my 
my child rearing philosophy, Jacqueline, and maybe it was informed by necessity, is I don't want to be the helicopter mom who's there to, uh, I don't know, do everything for my kids. They must figure these things themselves. Life is tough and we don't build resilient kids by babying them forever. Um, but I also do feel the pressure sometimes, especially when they're struggling emotionally or um, where I do ask myself, was this because of my absence? Um, could I have been a better mom? Um, could I have made a relationship work, uh, a long-term relationship that collapsed and which was very painful to have it collapse? Could I have made it work by doing something differently? Um, and the honest answer, when I'm not judging myself and feeling guilty is I don't think I could have. Um, and because it's not just balancing work life and home life, it's also balancing egos. It's also balancing societal judgment where even if the two of us as a couple kind of figured out our power dynamic, um, friends and his family members would make some silly comments about me sitting on his head or uh, the family needs money, go ask your wife since she's the breadwinner kind of comments which then would impact him. And, and sometimes you'd be having a conversation about something very mundane and then there's this outburst, yeah, you want to sit on my head. And then I know, okay, his stupid friend or his stupid cousin has been in his ear about something. Um, and, and, and I don't know what the answer to that is, Jacqueline. Um, we all need to navigate that power dynamic uh, between our children and our, our, our spouses carefully. Um, I remember my son and I, my son is now 26. We were having a conversation about what's the plan, my guy. Um, and he said, no, 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 he doesn't want to settle down. He still needs to start earning income because he doesn't want a wife who controls him financially. And I was so taken aback by his comment. And that evening I thought, what is it that this boy saw in the house that he's now talking to me about, he doesn't want a wife who's a breadwinner, who controls him. And the next day I actually got the courage to say, but <laughs> what did you mean there um, when you made that comment? And because I was trying to figure out, was this a lived experience? Is it society that was in his ear? Where did he get this perception that he must work hard and be the breadwinner because he can't allow a woman to be a breadwinner? So, so we have to constantly manage and check conversations and, and mindsets, not only of our own, but also of our loved ones. I, I don't know, uh, Jacqueline, if you've ever been in a conversation with a loved male figure, whether it's a father, an uncle, a brother, a husband, a boyfriend, um, and you're talking about something around gender equality, but their view is so backward that you just don't know where to start and you rather not engage this conversation because you don't want to get into an argument about this. And, and these are difficult conversations. Um, and, and then Eva is talking about liking the idea of male feminists. And, uh, and I see no problem with uh, men. I think the, the, the Prime Minister of Canada publicly identifies as a feminist because it's not a gendered term. Um, it's a term that has been weaponized to silence those who speak up for gender equality. And I do think more men should also speak up for gender equality in the same fashion that they would speak up against any form of oppression, whether they experience racism or tribalism, they're very good at asserting their rights. And, and we should all be good at asserting the rights of all people, um, including women. Um, I think, um, Kunde, I've answered the question already about uh, networking. And then Christelle is talking about South Pacific and strong patriarchal structures in most places and how um, it was strengthened by colonialism, which is exactly the African reality and especially misusing religious beliefs induced by the colonizers. Do you have any suggestions? on how to reach out to those in society um, who have deeply ingrained views in patriarchal, bolstered by religious and in our context, cultural views. Um, and it's, it's so interesting. I mean, I look at our, our sodomy laws, 
<laughs> which most are colonial relics and, and the colonial masters who convinced us that homosexuality is bad are the ones who are now castigating us. Yeah, you must change these sodomy laws, but you bought them. And now we're sitting with these problematic uh, belief systems. Uh, maybe you can be helpful um, in this regard. Uh, I look at um, topics like abortion. These are also mostly colonial uh, relics and, and many of them are informed by, by, by religious views. And, and some of our religious views are shaky, um, but also traditional views. Um, uh, Christel with us, some of our traditional leaders are very powerful. Some of our traditional healers um, and what some would maybe call witch doctors are powerful in shaping our views of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And I think um, how you um, approach people with deeply ingrained patriarchal views is partly legal. There's certain things that Namibia has just made illegal, child marriages, um, women not being able to inherit property because of cultural practices. Um, but then there are things that persist because of, of very deeply ingrained uh, traditional and, and cultural values. And I think what we need to stop doing is to stop speaking about um, our traditional healers or African spirituality or those we call witch doctors um, in a way that is almost disrespectful and almost removes their agency. I think we need to include them in the conversation um, and, and, and speak more about, because some of these cultural values are constructive. They do hold societies together, but we do need to review the ones that don't serve society anymore because cultural values just like laws have to evolve over time when did they become so rigid and can't be changed um so i think we need to be more open about it um i, I mean <laughs> and and some of them self-serving i remember in my family my father much to his disappointment ended up with uh, five girls and one boy so very quickly my father remembered a cultural practice where women aren't allowed to eat the tongue of a cow because apparently it makes us talk too much. Maybe he had a point because I do, my husband calls me machine gun off. Maybe it's because I was eating cow tongue instead of listening to my husband. But I always accused, sorry, my father, I always accused my father of making up this law because it was only him and his son who could now eat this very tasty cow tongue. So I think men do hang on to cultural and traditional practices that serve their purpose. Imagine being a male, uh, amongst many women and the cultural rule is that women may not inherit, very self-serving. So I think we do need representation at all levels, whether it's with our traditional healers, we need female ones, we need female judges, we need female magistrates, we need female uh, traditional leaders, because hopefully then they'll start to challenge some of these self-serving cultural values and help with the evolution of uh, religious and cultural values that are more consistent with our societal uh, uh, values instead of trying to hold people back. But your experience in the South Pacific is very much our experience um, in Africa where we've got patriarchal norms that have been bolstered by our, our historical past. Excuse me. And we have to figure out constructive ways um, to undo the damage that has been done to our societies. But we also know that it's not that easy to change societal mindsets. Um, Linda, I'm gonna let you take over. Thank you. Um, first lady, with your indulgence, I'd just like to ask you two final questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Thank you. So um, first one is from Edna Lenku from Kenya. Uh, she asks, I told, she says, I totally support every agenda towards feminism but then I'm wondering how you would deal with a political lady opponent trying to take over the presidency when you're still serving and you need a second term. And the last one is a personal question. Um, I did share with you an article that I wrote that was much inspired by your um, Women's Day address. And yes. I wondered what words of advice you'd have for women who are shrinking um, because yes. they want to avoid the attacks and the and the misogyny uh, and 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 
my own view is that we will be unable to create a critical mass of women in leadership okay. if women continue to shrink shrink themselves uh, because of society's expectations. So I just wanted your comment on that. Thank you. Um, so with Edna, um, what do you do with a female political opponent? Um, and I, that's such a difficult question. So in Namibia, we had our first female presidential candidate. And I was super pleased when she was nominated because she was the first uh, female head of a political party and she was our first national presidential candidate. Of course, I wanted my husband to win, but I didn't publicly hide that I was super pleased that she made it through these patriarchal barriers um, to, 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 to become this candidate. So I publicly tweeted about it and said, this is fantastic. This is, 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 uh, this is progress. So I also have mixed feelings about um, my ability sometimes to support female candidates from opposition parties, but I'm increasingly convinced that we have to do this. We can differ politically and still support each other as women. Because what we need to learn not to do is to allow ourselves to subscribe to gendered insults, for instance. If I'm around a table with male lawyers, maybe from my the same um, law firm or who are my friends, and they are making gendered comments about a female colleague who I maybe don't like, um, I should check myself and regulate that conversation and say, yeah, she's really not a great person, but you can't say that about her, around her children or about how she looks. But we can talk about um, her competence or something that is not gendered. So to resist this temptation, to participate in the gendered bashing of a woman who we don't like or who we don't politically agree with or who works at a law firm where there's a lot of com competition um, with ours. Um, and then Linda, you remind me of the article that you wrote. I, I loved it so much. And I think the whole Commonwealth Lawyers Association should actually thank you uh, for me being here because I was going to decline this invite until I saw that article because that article, I could have written that article. It, 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 it absolutely reflected my views. I, 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 I took ownership of that article. It felt like it was mine. So thank you for writing um, that article. And, and the issue of women who shrink, we don't shrink ourselves. We shrink because we realize I need to be less of what I currently am and more of what I'm expected to be in order to climb some ladders. I need to be less loud. I need to be less opinionated. I need to be less aggressive. I need to be less outspoken. And with all of this needing to be less so that we can fit into these small boxes, we realize that even when we lessen ourselves, even when we shrink ourselves, we are still too much. So <laughs> how far do you shrink yourself? And, and that's why I actually don't bother because I've seen women conform. I've seen them really do exactly what society expects them to do, but they still get called the names that they get called. And then I wonder, but <laughs> what's the point? Um, so, so my advice and, and, and is, is, is don't shrink yourself, but I'm also conscious not all women have the same personality that I have. Um, and there are women who uh, don't really want to deal with some of the rubbish or who aren't as, um, I don't know, um, I don't know what my character is, but I, I don't shy away from conflict or difficult conversations. If anything, I love them. Um, and maybe then it requires people who don't mind playing that role, playing more of that role, so that it's easier for those who have um, limitations, whatever those limitations are, to be understood when they do speak. Thank you. I've always been an advocate that it's normally the so-called radicals who bring the masses in. 
So thank you for being that outspoken voice for us. And thank you for the wonderful presentation. We couldn't have asked for anything more. And thank you for your indulgence in asking or answering all our questions. Lastly, we'd just like to call upon uh, Maria Mbeneka to give a brief vote of thanks, and then we will proceed to close our proceedings. Thank you once again, Madam Gengos. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Linda. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank our guest speaker today. I, I believe this has been the most fascinating and riveting um, public uh, speech that we've had as the CLA so far, and I'm happy that it's with you, uh, Madam Gengos, because um, you know you tick very many boxes uh, for me personally uh, as a lawyer and as a you know a leader by virtue of being the first lady. Uh, you've done an absolutely fantastic job this afternoon, and I'm sure a lot of the people who tuned in from all over Africa have, and the world have um, similar sentiments. Um, I dare say, as, uh, as, as I saw in one of the comments, that uh, you, do, you really are a breath of fresh air. So I won't, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to speak after such a brilliant speaker, but I would really like to appreciate you um, for some of the some of the topics that you've covered um, today, we've um, learned about the overtone window of social, uh, you know, mainstreaming, and um, you know, quite an opening fact uh, that you pointed out about uh, waiting for 136 years for us to be able to achieve, you know, parity in some of the processes and policies, and this is really, you know, something that all of us should take note of and try and do much, much more. Um, you know, your, your way of bringing around uh, the ge generational parallels and the evolution of women's rights um, over the years, especially in the last 50, 50 years in Africa. So um, just listening to you talking about, um, and not scatting around the issue of gender equality, because for us, um, and speaking from perhaps a Kenyan perspective, this has been really highlighted the nomination of uh, the incoming Chief Justice, uh, Lady Justice Martha Kome. For us, uh, it was a very, very big celebration fr from the you know, female fraternity in the legal profession, as well as women all over Kenya. Um, it's a question that we've had to confront and explain even to the public about even the composition of, of the Supreme Court. We've had even the election, uh, sorry, or uh, taking over of the vice president as the president of Tanzania has brought to the fore the issue of uh, women uh, as leaders and her style being different. And the fact that you ably um, were able to articulate about her having to assert herself as a president and, and not just a female president. And you'll see it even in the discussions because she's been here in Kenya, she had a state visit to Kenya about the discussions around how she dresses, uh, what she wore to a certain event. And it, for me, what quickly came to my mind is that who, who speaks about how the men dress? Um, but you know, it's expected that uh, the women will dress in a certain way and that will be a topic of discussion. And the cost of being an African uh, female leader, and of course the parallels you drew from the professional journey into the political space and the cost um, uh, for any female leader in that space. Um, for me, I think the issue of men supporting women's voices and versus mansplaining, because um, a lot of times we get men trying to explain what they think the women were saying, uh, as opposed to supporting the women's voices and the way the women articulate these issues. Um, I think that's a very powerful point that we should take note of uh, wherever we are. Um, your advice um, about being more intentional, that speaks to a lot of us. And I'm sure a lot of the women uh, joining in today uh, support that view. And um, you know your views on mentorship and um, you know it, taking up the spaces because it's, it's, it's often that um, female leaders or ladies in the professional space will shy away from taking up the spaces. And I, I thank you for encouraging us and to take up those spaces. Um, you definitely should visit. I saw there was some comments about uh, asking you to come and visit. And I see you serve, I think, on the same board with one of our notable professors, uh, PLO Lumumba. 
So we will encourage him uh, <laughs> to, to invite you here. And if he doesn't, you take this as an open invite. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam First Lady. We are truly, truly honored to have you today and we're really proud of you, Asante San. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Um, on behalf of the CLA, we wish you every success in every endeavor that you pursue, Madam First Lady. We're so grateful for the time you've given us. And we'd also like to thank our participants for having stayed on this long. We really appreciate your participation as well. Uh, just a reminder that our biannual conference will be in the Bahamas this year in September. So do sign up to attend that as well. Thank you so much to everybody who's been a part of this. Thank you to the Secretariat but most of course to our guest of honor. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody, and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.